Okay, it's the end of the session. Um, and uh, the ironic thing about Roxy is, although she has reacted to people that she has no, especially adults, uh, she's great around kids. She actually is completely passive, doesn't show any signs of aggression or tension or any of those things. She just couldn't be uh, any more relaxed. If you saw her with kids, you would never think that she had even the capacity for aggression. Um, and uh, I think a lot of this is based on the fact that she was uh, really under socialized as a puppy. Uh, her mother was really not going to nourish her. Uh, the guardians basically took her out of a situation she probably would have perished. And so they had her at three days old. And that's a really, really young age to get a puppy. Uh, too, too young, frankly. Um, but better than having the dog pass. But then they, uh, uh, we didn't go to puppy school. And so during a very formal, uh, formative uh, developmental period, what we call the critical socialization period, the dog did not get exposed to a lot of different people and situations. Um, the guardians here, uh, unlike most of my clients, actually have a lot of rules and structure in place. Uh, most of my clients ask them what rules they have. They can't come up with a single rule. These guardians, uh, just about all the rules that I usually, normally suggest, they already were doing before I even started the session. Um, and so, uh, which is great. Now we did talk about, uh, some of the rules we talked about that they didn't do would be like for one sitting before letting the dog in or out of a door. Sitting is a more subordinate position for dogs. And so we want them to practice sitting whenever we can. So what we do is we go to the door. Now the dog wants to go outside. I don't want to go outside. I go to the door and I say, sit once. The dog has now three seconds to sit. If it doesn't sit by the time I hit three, then I walk away and I sit down somewhere in the close proximity of the door. And no matter what the dog does, I ignore the dog. I don't say no. I'm saying no through my actions. And I wait one minute. After one minute, I go back to the door and I tell the dog again, sit. The dog can sit this time within three seconds. I walk away, but this time I walk away for two minutes. Next time I walk away for four minutes, then for eight minutes, I keep doubling the length of time until eventually when I go to the door and say sit, the dog sits automatically. And as soon as it sits, I open that door like there's remote control in their butt. And then the dog gets freedom. Uh, now, usually I would say the next step would be to tell the dog, uh, to teach the dog to wait before permission to go through the door. The gardens have already done that one. So again, another example of them doing the right things. So basically, um, I would start off with whatever direction you want. If she wants to outside, start it with her inside. If she wants to be inside, start it with her outside. And then eventually do it both directions. I would actually do it with all three dogs. And if one of the dogs comes up, or three dogs want to go up there and I say sit and one sits and the other three don't, then I let that dog out and I don't let the other dogs out. And so they have to pay for their performance. Uh, let me see. Another rule would be that the guardian, she needs to be eating before they feed their dogs. Dogs eat in the order of their rank. Right now, the guardians are free feeding the dogs and eating is the most important activity for dogs. So if we can have the dogs practice um, displaying, uh, well, they're practicing some self-control uh, by having a structured feeding. So what I want the guardians to do is start feeding the dogs inside, but eating them one at a time. So we put the uh, three bowls of food down. And then the dogs are not allowed to be within seven feet of it. Then the human who's feeding them is going to eat a chip or a carrot or a cracker or something crunchy, preferably, that they can eat in three or excuse me, five or more bites. After they get done, they're going to invite Roxy to come over. We're going to tap the bowl. And if Roxy comes over and eats, she has now a couple minutes to eat. As soon as she looks at the bowl, she's on the clock. She looks at the bowl and says, eh, I feel like eating and walks away. As soon as she walks away and she's longer than five feet away, pick up her bowl, dump it empty, put the empty bowl back down. It's important to put the empty bowl back down. Most of the time, the dog will go lick the empty. What's, what happened? Well, when you walk away, the food goes away. And then don't, she doesn't get fed till the next meal. And when she walks away, then I invite uh, either, uh, let me see, Cash or Prince, Prince over, whoever uh, is the older one, I think. Uh, yes. Prince is the older one? Okay. Cash is, okay. So we invite Cash in. When Cash is eating, Roxy and Prince are not allowed to be within seven feet of her. So that way all the dogs see us that we're not allowing them to go rush and try to intimidate their friend or the roommate to get their food. And the dogs eating sees that we're keeping the situation under control for them. That's a super duper important one for dogs eating is the most important activity. Now also remember that disengaging with your dog is a very powerful way of interacting with your dog and training your dog. And uh, the other video above I talked about if you're petting your dog and it puts a paw on your arm, that's a form of domination. Well then I stop petting. Well, a lot of people, when they do that, the dog, they're petting the dog and the dog puts his paw up here and then they stop. Well, what I would do is actually stop when the paw is just coming off of the ground. So the sooner you do it, the easier. And also remember when it comes to dogs, excited is not necessarily the same thing as happy. So if we pet an excited dog or a dog with an excited state, they're gonna continue to be excited. So we want them to be relaxed and calm when we're pet, petting and engaging with them. So when you guys come home, if she's all excited, any of the dogs are excited, act like they're not even there. Don't tell them no, don't tell them to sit. Just ignore them. And as soon as the dog kind of calms down, this is the dog, then I'm gonna start reaching for the dog. As soon as I reach, they'll start wiggling. 
pull your arm back and go back to doing what you're doing. And after a while, at first you'll only reach this far, then you'll be able to reach this far, then this far, then you'll be able to touch her. But anytime the excitement level starts going up, remember excited is not happy. It can be the same, but often they are separate and dogs are gonna make more mistakes when they're overexcited, overstimulated. So, um, all right, so um, when you uh, are feeding them, as soon as they start getting excited, just stop. Right now, they're not gonna be that excited because they get it free fed and they don't really see it as an excited thing. But once it's no longer available all the time, it's become more precious. Um, and in the video above, I really want the family to practice uh, some hard to get, with, uh, especially with uh, Roxy. The more we go to pet her for no reason, the more she's gonna have this big head and think that she's in charge of security and that we revolve around her. I want her to think she revolves around us. And the more we take play hard to get, if I, want to, if I want to pet Roxy, tell her to sit. If she doesn't sit, then I got other things. I pull out my phone and work on something else. If she sits, I pet her under the chin and say the word sit or whatever it is like I talked about in the video above. Um, okay, so we also talked about exercise. Um, Roxy actually played, well, before we get to that, we'll start, the first thing we talked about was the drop command. Um, the guardian asked, uh, he likes to play fetch with her and she likes to fetch, but she doesn't like to drop the ball. So he kind of physically takes the ball away from her. Part of that time, she probably thinks that's fun, it's a game. But it also gives us the opportunity, or we miss the opportunity to teach her a skill. So what I would do is when you're playing fetch, well, or not when you're playing fetch, when she just is hanging out and she's got something in her mouth, not when she's holding on to it and chewing it, but when it's exclusively in her mouth, pull out a high value training treat, go over there and hold it in front of her nose and just hold it there. Don't tell her to do anything, just wait. And eventually she'll try to take it with the object in her mouth and she'll figure out she can't do that. And eventually she'll carefully put it down. See, are you gonna try to take it? Don't show any interest in whatsoever. And don't tell her anything. As soon as she drops it, pop the treat in her mouth, say the word drop, and then just lean back and watch TV to go back, do what we're doing. So we're telling the dog, when you have stuff in your mouth, if the human tells you to drop it, and you drop it, they'll give you something better than what you have, and then you get original stuff back. And that's a really good deal. Now we start off with what we call low value items, her toys and things she's allowed to have at any point. Then we gradually start working up to higher and higher value items. She, I don't think has a resource guarding problem, but she does growl. Now it's important to understand a growl is not necessarily aggression. A growl can be the antithesis of aggression. So if I'm eating and a dog comes near me, another dog comes near me, I'm gonna growl. And that's a dog's way of saying you're getting too close. Remember, anything your dog's doing when you pet is what you're enforcing. But also anything that your dog does in your presence that you don't specifically disagree with, you're saying I'm cool with it. So if she is, if she's eating food and I approach her and she doesn't growl at me, she's saying I'm cool with you coming and trying to sweat me for my food. So a growl is really the antithesis of aggression in that situation, saying, I don't want to be aggressive, but you're getting too close. If I'm in a dressing room, somebody tries to come in when I'm changing, I'm going to growl at them in a human way. If they continue trying to come in after I say I'm occupied, I'm going to start bracing the door or pushing them back. I'm going to escalate my level of retort until I get my point across, and the dog will do the same thing. So uh, now she may have, uh, if she does have a resource guarding problem, which some dogs do have, and it's not classic, ironically, it's not classified as aggression because if, as soon as you remove the resource, the dog is fine. So um, I suggested that uh, the guardians give her some good chew toys because she likes to chew things a lot, and I think she's doing that to cope with stress. So one of the things I recommend the guardians do is go to the green spot here, 72nd and Pacific, and get some kneecaps. Um, they will look like kind of distorted chunks of flesh. And uh, so if you give her one, now, if we are, let's say she's sitting here and we come down the stairs that are off camera and approaching, when we get to a certain distance, she's kind of chewing it, she's cool, and all of a sudden when she, you start to get too close, she's gonna go, she's gonna freeze and kind of hover over it and get really stiff. She might bare her teeth, and that's an indication, hey, you're getting too close, I'm getting ready to explode at you to tell you you're getting too close, because again, if I don't disagree, then I'm cool with you approaching. So we take note, let's say we're at 15 feet away when she does that. We immediately turn and walk away, leave the room, so she kind of goes back to relaxing, she goes back to chewing her bone. Then we grab some high value training treats, I like using these tricky trainer chicken liver, and then uh, approach, but this time we stop at 16 feet. So we stop a foot further away than the last time what caused her to freeze. And she sees us, but she's still chewing, we take one of the treats out and we roll it towards her, so it's just right there in front of her, and then she licks up and we walk away. And we approach from a different angle and do the same thing, also at 16 feet. And keep on doing that until eventually she just like almost looks up at us. She stops chewing her thing. She's like, are you going to give me a treat? Then we can next time try to go to 15 feet. And if she doesn't freeze again, then we repeat all those treat deliveries. Then we go to 14, 13, 12. We gradually get to the point where we're right there. We're earning her trust by what we're not doing. 
This is why when we ask her to drop, we practice the drop. And the drop you practice just when she's just hanging out. You're not, you're not gonna rep it. Just when you're watching TV and she's got some in her mouth, you just pull a treat out of your mouth, go over there, get her drop, drop, and then you just lay back and watch more TV. She goes back to chewing your bone. And once you get that enough, then when you're the resource guarding thing, she doesn't, that's the first stage of helping her understand, I'm not here to take your stuff. And then we prove it by approaching her and dropping all these great treats. And after a while, she's like, I like it when people come towards me. I, matter of fact, I don't have to growl. I'm actually gonna wag my tail and be like, yes, please, somebody come and give me more treats. Um, so we also talked about uh, creative exercise. She likes to fetch. I like the guardian to use the fetch. Now the fetch is a wonderful exercise if your dog does do it. Now she doesn't drop the ball. So the first stage for this fetch is he's gonna throw the ball when she comes back to him. He's gonna have a treat waiting here. Not gonna say anything to her. Let her see that you have it. Maybe sometimes you have to pull this out, make a little noise you're doing, then you kind of hold the treat here. She'll come over when she drops it, pop in her mouth, say the word drop. And then if, she, if she's kind of cool with it, or you could actually, you could do, give her one and then show her you have a second one, kind of keep her attention here. Then reach down and pick up the ball, but when you pick it up, don't snatch it. Just very casually get it and then throw it. And when she comes back, tell her drop. But after a while, she'll come and she'll just start spitting the ball. After a while, you won't have to say drop. She'll just come over and drop it automatically. This is almost a watch what you watch what you wish for because eventually she'll come and you'll watch on the TV on the couch and she'll drop balls for you. But that's good because we're not fighting her for it. We're helping her see that I need to give it up to the humans. It's a good opportunity of practicing that, that mindset. So once she gets to the point where she's coming and dropping it, when you, as soon as you say or dropping it on herself, then I would pick it up and then tell her to, or I would tell her to sit. And don't pick it up until she sits. Sit once. One, two, three. You don't sit by the third. Then I lean back on the couch and I go back to doing what I'm doing. But if she does sit, then I pick it up and then I throw it. And after a while, she'll come back and she'll drop the ball and she'll sit automatically. Then we pick it up and we tell her wait. And as soon as you go like that, she'll get ready to take off. And so you kind of keep on messing with her until eventually, until you say go or whatever the command word is, she doesn't go get the treat. So we're building in a lot of exercise uh, exercise number one, respect for the uh, uh, human as an authority figure, practicing listening to the human, practicing dropping, practicing giving up and not, pr not uh, protecting high value items. It, it's a game for us, and it is, or for her, but it's a good way for us to help her, motivate her to want to listen to us and do a lot of the things that we want to do because the only way we're going to play her game is we play by our rules. And after a while, she'll start offering those things on her own. Um, now, I also went over another way of exercising a dog uh, that I call a doggy stairmaster. What I do is I go to the top of the stairs with, remember, do it with an empty stomach, show the dog you have a treat or touch the nose, and throw the treat down the bottom of the stairs. The dog runs down and licks it up, and we say the word Mexico, or a word that means go south. Problem is for Roxy, she thinks she's a stunt dog. She launches herself down the flight of stairs. It's not a full flight of stairs, it's a split level house, but still, that can be dangerous. So, what I would do at first when you're doing this, uh, have her on, this is another handler there with you, and have her on the leash. So one of you throws the treat down there and the other one walks her down there, licks it up, and then we walk her back up. So we do that over and over again until after a while we do it without the leash and she's walking instead of launching herself down and up. So um, I, I recommend the guardian start what we call a, uh, um, as, uh, a exercise journal. Just get a spiral notebook, write down the date at the top of a fresh sheet of paper every day, write down each dog's name in a column, and then write down the time on the left side and write down like, you know, 7.15, Played fetch for 50, you know, for 15 minutes. Um, you know, 8.20 or, you know, 8.45, uh, did seven up downs on the stairs. So the stairs, we want to count each down up as one. And remember, the first time you do it, do it uh, until the dog doesn't go down there anymore to get it. And that way you know what the dog's maximum number is. We want to exercise them somewhere between a third and 75% of their maximum number multiple times a day. Most of us, we think of exercising like us for humans. We exercise in the morning, we're good all day. They need it every couple hours. In the exercise journal, we write down all these things in there and also noteworthy stuff. If the dog has an accident or a barking incident or jumps up or whatever it is, write the time and what was going on. Not a paragraph, but just a little bit of a sentence or two. And then after the, and then the, the end of the day, we give each dog a separate letter grade, A through F. If the dog got anything better, better other than an A, the next day we uh, give them maybe a couple more up downs of the stairs, a couple more fetches. Um, a longer walk or whatever it is. And we keep them playing with, around with those elements until the dogs get an A plus behavior. So sometimes we're gonna increase the repetition, sometimes we had a whole extra exercise that's really low grade. And eventually we get to the point where we know how much exercise the dog needs and we can fold that into our day and our daily routine. So instead of being an, uh, an inconvenience, we kind of expect it and we're now helping the dog perform better because we're depleting that excess energy. Remember, if you're gonna have guests come over or there's a busy day on the golf course, exercising her before you put her in the yard is a great way to do it. Exercising before guests come over. 
or new clients or whatever the case may be. Depleting that excess energy helps set her up for success. Also, um, she's got to be muzzled. And so if I forget to put this on there, please message me. Uh, but on the right, right up above, I should have a link to what I call a conditioned emotional response or a CER, which is a way of basically uh, introducing the muzzle in a positive way. And so I'm not gonna go through it here because the video will just explain it, but when you're muzzling your dog, you don't wanna put the muzzle on and put them in a dangerous situation. That makes them almost more fearful and more reactive and they will hate the muzzle. What I wanna do is get the dog just to the point where it likes the muzzle and is happy to have it on through the technique that I hopefully have linked above. And then after a while, once the dog is comfortable with it, then I have the dog wearing the muzzle when it's at home and it's just all the family and there's no stress whatsoever and the dog gets used to it. Now you might give her um, you know, some, something with peanut butter to, to lick on. The, the nice thing about the muzzle, it does allow her to drink water and eat food through it. So what you might wanna do is exercise her first, give her 10 minutes to, react, to calm down, then give her the, uh, put the muzzle on once you've done all the stuff that I talked about in the other video, and maybe get a long bully stick and can go through the, the grill of the muzzle. She can hold it and she can chew on it while she's wearing the muzzle. So we're creating a positive association with the muzzle, not just when the muzzle goes on, we're gonna be around other people or dogs that you don't like, and that causes the dog to be fearful and reactive. Instead, we're gonna help the dog practice wearing the muzzle in a calm and balanced state of mind in the most tranquil situation or environment they have at home. Um, and so, uh, let me see. I'd also like to see the guardians uh, teaching her new tricks or commands. Right now, because she was at three, three days old, she came home, and she only knows about three or four commands right now. Now, training and behavior are separate, but there is some carryover, passover between the two in terms of self-esteem and confidence. When people graduate high school, they get a boost of self-esteem. They graduate college, or they get a new job, or they assign a new skill, or learn a new skill, they feel better about ourselves. And the same, same principle works for dogs. Most dogs that are reactive are coming from a, a feeling of insecurity or fear and, uh, and stress. And I'm pretty sure that in her case, she's stressed out. And uh, we just have uh, guardians coming and going. The guardians here have a very noble uh, cause. I won't say what they do, but it's something that we need more in society. And uh, anyways, um, so um, exercising her before uh, we're going to put the muzzle on can be set her up for success. Um, exercising her before stressful, you know, people are going to be delivering or whatever these things are sets her up for success. And then teach her new tricks and commands gives us different ways of redirecting her attention and also boost her self-esteem. The last thing I'd like the guardians to do is because they're gonna be teaching these new tricks is come up with fun command words. Now there are a lot of kids in the house and so I, unless the help of the kids, maybe have each kid come up with a word for each new command and then they tell mom and dad and then mom and dad at, uh, at dinner and then mom and dad decide after dinner what the command word is gonna be and try to set it up so each kid has a, a command or two. That'll help the kid feel a little bit more engaged. I taught the dog stunt dog means roll over. You know, you actually teach the dog stunt dog but they came up with a command word come up with funny command words. Anytime you have dogs that are reactive reactive or insecure or whatever it is, come up with these funny command words breaks the mood and brings some levity to the situation. And if everybody's calm and relaxed and kind of laughing, that makes the dog kind of feel more relaxed. Just like if we're having an argument and a friend of ours that's the life of the party comes up and starts cracking jokes, they can break the tension and ease the mood. So I'd like you to come up with a list of the official command words. Most of us use 10 different words or expressions for each command. Come here. Come here, come here, over here, here girl, dog's name, dog's nickname, something else, and a tap my thigh and a whistle. So now the dog's gonna listen for 10 words out of the 2,000 to 11,000 words each human says every day. That's very difficult. But if we all say here, that makes it much easier for the, uh, for the dog. They only have to listen for one word. So come up with a list of the official command words, put it on the refrigerator, and then anytime somebody's saying come here, and you're like, ah, vocabulary, they're like, thank you, come. So that way the dog starts listening for one word. We make it easier for the dog. Now come and sit are pretty ubiquitous, use those. But when I want my dog to lay down, I say crash or chill. I have a client who is a baseball fan. They call it a uh, slide. I have another client that uh, they like also baseball. Uh, they call going to the dog kennel dugout. Come up with the names because the dogs here are kennel. Come up with a funny name for each one. Kids like always call it Hogwarts or you know, something kid related, Disneyland or whatever you want to call it. They call it castle that makes people kind of laugh or penthouse or whatever it is. And if you say a kennel, the dog goes to the kennel, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not gonna make anybody smile. But if we can come up with these funny command words, that can really help. 
Now, the dog's also a little bit territorial around the house. And I think a lot of it is because, um, uh, well, the dog's a little bit confused. And so one of the things we can do is help the dog develop uh, a positive association. So we have kind of a public area behind the yard and the dogs, and there's a lot of traffic there. So what I would suggest the guardians do is, uh, first of all, remember that PVC pipe on top of the fence, if you need, in, I would just probably do that just as a safeguard. What I would do is I'd enlist the help of my friends and have my friends go in the backyard outside of my house through the public area and have them do it one at a time and get like a piece of string cheese, slice it up into little quarters or like little pepperonis and as, them, as they're approaching the house, don't look at the dog, don't try to talk to the dog. But as they, if this is the fence, as soon as I reach where the fence is, I'm just gonna take a pepperoni, throw it over the fence. Walk a couple more steps, throw it over the fence. And if the dog is super reactive have, and the fence is right here, have them increase the distance away from the fence. The farther away they are, the less threatening that they will appear to be the dog. We wanna to get to the point where she's gonna be somewhat reactive. And at first, you might have to be 10 feet away. But then the, guard, the people can get a little bit closer, a little bit closer, or sometimes they do like in a diagonal sort of a shape. Um, and it kind of triangular. And then eventually the dog starts to associate. Every time people come, they throw this pieces of cheese over the fence. I'm deciding I like cheese. And so therefore I like the people coming. And so instead of thinking my, my job is to protect them, I'm gonna sit down and wag my tail in a happy, relaxed posture because they're here to bring me stuff, not somebody that I need to worry about. Um, let me see, um, anything else that I went over that you want me to cover in this? I do this a lot, so I'm pretty good at summarizing this. Now, we're going to probably set up a follow-up session with this one, depending on how things go with the dog. Um, so I'd like you guys to practice this stuff really for a month and be really strict about it for a month. Um, after a month, the dog kind of gets into a behavior pattern itself and it just kind of automatically starts doing that stuff. A lot of people, when we have a lot of kids in the house, a lot of busy stuff, we're kind of doing a, as much as we can. Then we slack off, we do something, not slack off, we do other things. Well, the dog really doesn't learn the full Monty of what we're looking to do. So really for a month, really try to just go to the nines on every single thing to get the dog kind of in a habit of it. Then you can kind of back off the second month, the dog kind of stays on autopilot. Now, because we have a lot of kids in the house, I went over my technique about uh, rewarding the kids with chocolate. So uh, to summarize it, what I do real quickly is I get like a mug or glass. I have, the, have an arts and crafts day where all the kids like write, take glue and they write their name on the side of the glass, put glitter or whatever you want on it and their baseballs or whatever they're into. And then we explain to the kids and have a piece of chocolate. Just go, you know what? I found out from the dog guy that when we say thank you, when we pet our dog, that's how we say thank you. Would you say thank you before or after I gave you this piece of chocolate? And they're like, uh, before? Well, there's the little kids. And I say, think about it. And they're like, after. That's right. Here's a piece of chocolate. And they go, thank you. Exactly. So from now on, every time you want to pet the dog, I want you to ask Roxy to sit or Prince or Cash. And then when they sit, pet her under her chin and say the word sit. And then you can pet her as long as you want. But don't say good sit. Just say just sit. And then if you come and tell mom and dad, we'll take an M&M and we'll go put it in your jar. Put it in the jar somewhere where the kids can't get. And then at the end of the day, at dinner time, we all go grab our jars and we dump them on our plate. We count up who had the most M&Ms. And you can maybe even add an added bonus. Whoever gets the most M&Ms doesn't have to do dishes or gets a special piece of pie or cake or something like that. But they also get those M&Ms as a reward. So we got a lot of kids in the house. So if the kids all start averaging 30, 40, 50 M&Ms a day, that's like 250, 300 practices for uh, um, uh, Roxy on good things that we want her to do. And she's gonna start emulating those more often. She's gonna start respecting the kids. Not that she doesn't now, but just it's more repetition. It's just more reinforcement. And after a while, you're gonna have uh, the dogs uh, just automatically offering me all these great behaviors because that's what gets people's attention. So, um, uh, and the thing not to do that, make sure you don't spoil it. A lot of people will put like, uh, oh, you didn't make your bed and you're gonna lose an M&M. Don't do that, only dog related stuff. And also if, the, if one of the children, like if you have a four year old going steps on the dog's paw, say, oh, I have to take all your M&Ms away for that. Or, you know, or if they dip pet without a purpose, you just take, I have to take this away. Would you like to earn this again? They say, sit, and like, sit, sit. Okay, and we put it back there. So we don't actually have to take it away, but it's a nice stick and carrot routine. And because we have in this house, we have a lot of kids coming and going, this would be a great like house rule. And then the dog sees a new person coming, new people, they need more treats. I like it when we have more pe new people in the house. And the more that the dog is comfortable, right now the dog is very comfortable on kids. The only time it's reactive is around adults. And just uh, and that's really the opposite. Usually we have a situation where the dog is reactive around kids, but fine with adults because kids are unpredictable. But the kids here are pulling on the dog's ears and tail, and the dog didn't blink, bat an eye, didn't show any uh, signs of stress, like holding its breath or freezing or licking its lips or baring its teeth or the tail or hackles going up. Uh, a lot of people are prejudiced against pit bulls, but pit bulls actually used to be called the nanny dog. They are usually great with kids, 
And uh, Roxy is a great example of this. Now we don't want to push it, so we do want to make sure that the kids are being respectful of the dogs. So when the dog's eating, make sure we keep the dog uh, dogs away. One last thing I do with dogs and kids is I tell the kids if the dog is in the kennel or on their dog bed, we are not allowed to interact with them. Dogs have a fight or flight response. If the dog sees every time I go to my dog bed, I'm free and I'm safe. Well, if the kids are doing something I don't want, I'm overheated. I go lay on the dog bed and I'm cool. They can't mess with me or the kennel. So we want the dog to uh, feel like it's empowered to move itself away just to make sure that we're no problems with the dogs now, but we want to make sure that's the case. And so that's a great little safeguard to go in there. All right, normally I would have uh, the dogs right here, but that would not work out for very well for me being somebody that uh, Roxy doesn't know quite yet. Hopefully we'll get there in the future. Uh, but this is Roxy, Prince, and Cash's Roadmap to Success. Remember, everything you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.